Thank you, Jan. It's always a pleasure to be here in Denmark. I have many good memories of the GoTo conferences as they are uh, all... Um, actually, I won't try to pronounce the original name. Maybe that's one reason the name was changed. So what I'm going to talk about today is something that I think perhaps should be obvious, but I'm not sure we're behaving as though it's obvious. And that is putting the software in software delivery. What do I mean by that? Let's think about how we typically do software delivery. So this example actually comes from Circle CI. This is actually how they build, some of how they build Circle CI. So here we have a YAML um, file. And I know that it's going to be hard to read this, but I think, I think everyone know what, knows what this kind of stuff looks like. Bit of an eye chart, but you know what? It's got to be small because there's a lot of it. There's 957 lines here, and there's a lot going on here. So we're calling out multiple bash scripts. We're, we're essentially doing imperative programming. Above all, when we want to do anything complicated, we call into bash. So here you can see that there's a prepare build um, script. That's actually our old friend bash. And again, even if you can't read the lines, I think you have a pretty good idea of what bash and shell scripting looks like. So this is pretty much the state of the art. If you're using, a, you know, I'm not just picking on Circle, uh, on um, GitLab, take, for example, Circle. This is actually the first example was GitLab, this is Circle. Very, very similar model, where you essentially have steps defined in YAML. Your YAML fundamentally comes down to lists of calls to bash. So very similar model. Let's see what's going on here. You can see that we've got this less than, less than thing in YAML. How many people know what that does? Less than, less than in YAML is a standard thing. Turns out YAML is powerful. YAML is very, very powerful. Less than, less than is a map merge in YAML. And you can do fancy match merges. You can, this is from the YAML spec, you can merge two maps. You can merge multiple other maps into an existing map. You can override the map, um, particular entries as you're merging into a map. In fact, you can do so much in YAML that I wonder why we need programming languages at all. I think it's a legitimate question because YAML, it's got really pretty fancy stuff in it. And of course, when you match YAML up with Bash, you get the ability to do pretty much anything. How many people knew that Bash has a case statement? How many people have used the Bash case statement? So those of you who've used the Bash case statement know that it terminates with ESAC, which of course is case backwards. This possibly makes sense when you think that Bash is about the same age as C. So you know maybe some of those conventions didn't catch on quite as well as the curly brace convention. So you can do case statements in Bash. The syntax is kind of weird, but you can do it. You can also um, use the semicolon, semicolon, ampersand operator. Personally, I think you should always ask whether a language has a semi, semi, semicolon, semicolon, ampersand operator. Does your language have one of those? It's not a real language unless it has one of those. So, you know, I think it's legitimate to ask the question when we look at this kind of thing which we're familiar with from delivery, what would it be like if we wrote our applications the way we deliver them? So, you know, if we wrote our applications as we write our delivery, we'd start off in YAML. So this is again from the, this is from the GitLab CI file, so, you know, this is, um, essentially a really nice imperative programming model. It's like, you know, there are languages that have these fancy concepts like loops and recursion. You don't need that. You can just do it all in YAML and call out into Bash. And of course, Bash is so powerful that you can actually implement Tetris in Bash. This URL, this really works. It's pretty impressive. Uh, I think it's about 900 lines of Bash and it actually is a game that you can play. So in short, with these two things together, we can do pretty much anything we might want to do. 
So, you know, we're very troubled in the developer community by language wars. So, you know, we have Java people, we have Kotlin people, we have JavaScript people, TypeScript people, Clojure people, Haskell people, Scala people, C Sharp people. Maybe we should all declare a tris and just embrace this as the best way of programming. Who thinks that this is a good idea? That's very interesting, isn't it? Because we've just all agreed in this room that it would be absolutely crazy to try to write an app the way we deliver almost all of our apps. That's interesting. It's a bit surprising, perhaps, that you know, we're using this approach everywhere when we clearly don't think it's that great. Why is it not that great? Well, amongst other things, YAML has many quirks. Some of, one of YAML's funniest quirks is particularly relevant here in Scandinavia. So if you have a list in YAML and the elements are DK, SE, and NO, that actually evaluates to the string SE, the string DK, and false. There are, in fact, 22 ways to specify true and false in YAML, and some of them are quite surprising. There are also bizarre reference syntax, and then, of course, it's white space sensitive. So, you know, arguably, YAML is, even as a configuration format, it's debatable. Um, as a programming language, it really is pretty terrible. And I think we very recently started to see quite um, an awareness of this with respect to YAML. So we've seen lots of respected people like, say, Kelsey Hightower um, and even the author of Ansible talking about the problems they're starting to see from overuse of YAML. One of the best tweets I think I've seen, I hope you can read this, um, is an example of how if relational databases were invented today, we wouldn't have SQL. We would do it in YAML. And that would be really fun, because then if you actually misformatted your white space, your query might behave differently. That would be a far better world. Similarly, Bash is not exactly at the cutting edge. It's not like the you know, most beautiful programming language that we have. Bash itself was defined in 1989, but the concepts are from the early 70s. To put this into geopolitical context, when Bash was first defined, this guy, President Ronald Reagan, was leaving office. But, in fact, when the core concepts that went into Bash were defined, uh, Richard Nixon had not even gotten to his second term. I think he was actually currently um, involved in the events that led to the Watergate scandal. So, you know, these are not the newest technologies out there. Lest I come across as being you know, wholly negative about Bash, I'd point out that it actually is a brilliant concept. The notion of having something that's scriptable, that can glue all your programs together that are running on a machine, that's pretty brilliant. And that was like one of the key innovations in Unix. But that is what it's for. It's for scripting. It is not something that gives you a true module system. It doesn't give you a true standard library. Um, it essentially relies on the path being like the way you get into real programs that are written to do more complex things. Scripting does not scale. So the YAML and Bash approach definitely has its issues. There are other approaches we use in delivery as well. One of them is we use UI-driven approaches. So here, this, I mean, there's numerous examples of this. This particular one comes from the Spinnaker website. But this is what we do to set up a new application with Spinnaker and Jenkins. And I'll have to talk slowly because it will take a while. There are quite a lot of screens that we need to click through to do this. This is essentially upmarket YAML. This is kind of the luxury equivalent of YAML. Why is it like YAML? It's like YAML because essentially you're filling in the blanks and you're calling out to bash to do the harder work. So it's, it's actually conceptually very similar. It's just that you have a whole lot of clicking and it's not very scriptable. So it has the same deficiencies. Essentially, you know, this is a luxury product. 
but a luxury product retains the characteristics of the original. I don't know why, I think, I think you know what made me think of this particular image, um, given that I was into presidents um, for the course of this, um, this talk. So, you know, it has the same deficiencies. And there really is a key problem here. How many people have read 1984 by George Orwell? Wonderful book. So, one of the core elements of 1984 is the concept of newspeak. The totalitarian government in 1984 wants to limit its ability, the ability of its citizens to think. So, they realize that actually replacing English with a new language called newspeak, which is a very small subset of English, doing that would limit the thoughts people could have. The goals of Newspeak were to make subversive thoughts literally impossible to formulate. I strongly encourage not only read the book, read Orwell's preface about Newspeak and its purpose. It's really quite brilliant. Um, so Newspeak differed from all, the, all other languages in that its vocabulary grew smaller instead of larger. Each reduction was a gain. Since the smaller the area of choice, the smaller the temptation to take thought. Why is this relevant? This is relevant because those kind of fill in the blanks in UIs um, that we saw here, they are very like Newspeak. There are certain blanks that you can fill in. If someone didn't think of the right blank for you, well, you're kind of out of luck. So there's a considerable limit to flexibility. I mean, overall, I'm pretty skeptical about a lot of things like low code. I think that we've found that code is a really good way to express things. And when you pull back on externalizing things to that degree, you lose a lot of power. So essentially, tool vendors are not trying to control your mind like the party in 1984. The problem is that your problems have to be aligned with things they envisioned. You essentially need a crystal ball for the fill-in-the-blanks approach really to work. If you have a problem that isn't um, foreseen, it may be difficult to solve it. Of course, there are other solutions out there that are somewhat more capable. So, for example, there's the notion of pipelines as code, where you have, say, a Jenkins file in every repo, and you have a shared collection of functions. You also have a DSL that's groovy rather than Bash, so at least it has the advantage of being rather more modern than Bash. This is better, but it still suffers from the same Newspeak problem. So essentially, you have to determine in each repo what are the steps, what is the pipeline, where you're going to fill in the blanks with this functionality that you've put into you know, some of your shared functions. And also, you've got a lot of pipeline files. So if you need to change those pipeline steps, you're going to be changing a lot of places. So arguably better, but still suffering some of the same problems, and which is you know, not really that surprising because it's an iteration of a relatively old approach. So of course, this could ju be just me criticizing languages and tools and whatever, which is you know, something that in this industry we probably tend to do too much. But it really does matter. It matters because there are genuine practical problems that we find it very hard to solve in software delivery. One of the biggest problems is a relatively new problem. It's pipeline proliferation. When our present approach to software delivery grew up about 10 years ago, we had a very small number of very complex projects. Right? We'd have a small number of multi-million line projects, even in a large enterprise. So of course, the builds and the delivery of all of those things was different. Obviously, everything at that scale is a special snowflake. This is not the case. Even in large enterprises, you see people embracing smaller services. All large enterprises are doing this in at least part of their business. So they're going towards cloud native, they're going towards microservices or whatever they call it, where these things are way, way smaller. 
but there are a lot more of them. And of course, that totally changes the software delivery landscape because now you suddenly start dealing with the duplication problem. So you know, if you had five very complex, very different things, who cares, you've got five pipelines. Now you've got 500 or even 5,000. 5,000 separate pipelines, you want to update something across all of them? Hmm, not great. You can't specify policy at that level. Massive duplication, hard to evolve. Similarly, another practical problem we face overall with our present approach to software delivery is lack of testability. How do we test our pipelines? Well, typically, we just make a commit and see if things um, fall over or find their way to production. This is not how we engineer software, right? We generally, in building our apps, we expect something better than that. There's also kind of no overall model or framework. Remember what Bash is designed for? Bash is designed for programs to communicate very loosely in the context of a shared machine using the path and environment variables. You know what? 70 years of computer science, we've come up with some rather more sophisticated means of communication between um, you know, different pieces of logic than environment variables. So we don't really have a strong model or framework, which means that everything tends to be a bit ad hoc. It's like solving one problem doesn't necessarily make the next problem easier to solve. You might think, does this really matter? Sure, you know, there's, there's arguably some problems. Does it matter? Let's think of the reasons that we might continue to do delivery this way. The principal reason is that delivery just isn't important. So, you know, essentially we're hacking it, it kind of just works, it's fine. I think many of us, most of us, possibly all of us, at some point have subscribed to that. I know I did. Um, but the fact is, it is not good enough. You run into the testability problem, you run into needing to make changes across many repos. You do encounter things that matter and then you think, hmm, if we'd approach this as an engineering problem, maybe we'd have better answers. Another reason to continue to do delivery this way is because we think that somebody else will do it. So, you know, perhaps an army of magical elves will appear and fix it for us, and we're waiting for the elf army. I thought of this because one of the times I spoke in Go to Copenhagen, there was someone who actually read the Elves and the Shoemaker, I think, at um, one of the evening events. Elves make really beautiful shoes they're not so good at fixing build pipelines. I've ne never met an elf who can fix a build pipeline. So I don't think we should rely on the elf army coming to rescue us. Another reason to do delivery this way is because we've always done it this way. So for example, if you think about modern CI files, they're kind of fundamentally a bit like Make. Actually, Make was rather more expressive. Um, but you know, they're fundamentally the same kind of thing and make is venerable. Make dates from the Nixon era. It's another great Nixon era technology. This, of course, is something that drives a lot of actions. I'm Australian, and one of my friends from university um, did a PhD at Cambridge, and she said one of the Cambridge professors said to her, Sonia, if you're ever puzzled about anything in England, don't ask why. Ask for how long? So, you know, essentially, if you ask why, you would think, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do it this way. But then if you've always done it that way, maybe it happens. Another reason, of course, is organizational. So we view this as a non-engineering problem. Therefore, we don't bring our engineering discipline to it. And I think this is a very real issue in many organizations. I would argue that this is not the way of the future. Software is eating the world, but developers and the way developers work are eating software. We are moving away from that stark divide between developers and operations. Everyone knows that. I think we just need to continue to internalize that realization and take it farther. Another reason to continue to do it is that we actually like Newspeak and that we think that it's better to be constrained in what we can express than to give people the power to express their own unique thoughts. 
This, one, this one's an intellectually valid argument. I strongly disagree, as you probably suspect, but it is actually a valid argument, and for some teams that might be the case. The problem is that not only do we not have great solutions to the obvious problems that almost everyone has, we have no solutions at all for many of tomorrow's problems. I would argue that we're setting the bar in software delivery too low. We're just content with just making it work and not realizing that wouldn't we want it to be great. For example, organizations value different things. So you know, Facebook, I don't know if they still use that slogan, move fast and break things was you know, their kind of engineering slogan. They did move fast. I don't think they intended one of the things they broke to be the United States, but we are where we are. Netflix, slight variant on this. We don't think about uptime at all costs. We prize velocity of innovation. So in other words, they don't want to be bogged down in too much governance and compliance. They just want to be able to move quickly. And if every so often you or I need to refresh a few times to see our movie, or Breaking Bad, or um, whatever, that's fine. Perfectly valid business choice. Banks are at the absolute other end of the spectrum, right? Banks care passionately about governance. Banks are regulated. They can't take risks. So every organization has a different approach and a different set of policies that they would like to implement overall. And presently, it's really hard to do that. Teams really should be able to work the way they want um, and you know, according to creating custom delivery policies according to their needs. It's really hard to be that expressive about it today. Secondly, we need to be able to evolve delivery. I mean, it's not like we create a build pipeline and we're done. Remember Equifax? Before Equifax, my experience was that at least in the United States, most companies didn't care a lot about um, security vulnerability scanning. It was on the list, but they'd get around to it whenever. After Equifax, um, every CIO in the country was hauled up before the board saying, what are you doing to ensure that we don't have that problem? And suddenly, it became an enormous thing. So we need, for example, to be able to say, hey, let's apply this scanning to all our projects. And presently, it's really hard to do that. Um, we need to be able to automate more things. It's really important for us to be able to move quickly, both in our apps and in our delivery. And you know, ideally, we'd like to be able to unleash developer creativity. Obviously, developer creativity is possible in Bash. Somebody wrote Tetris in Bash, so creativity is possible. But let's say there are environments and languages and module systems that stimulate more developer creativity than Bash. So we can do better. So coming back to presidents, you know, I think the bar for presidents is raised since the 70s and 80s. Unfortunately, I'm not sure this guy's still president, but I think this is kind of where the, I would hope the bar for presidents was. We can do better. So when Obama first came to office, his message was really about hope and change. So if we were going to be hopeful about change in this space, where would it come from? I would say it's pretty clear where it would come from. It would come from advances in development and delivery, because we've had tons of learnings in the last 15 years. Let's look at some of them. The next slide I barely need to throw up because Jorn made this point for me. It was very bad. Um, early J2EE, EJB, it was bad. This is the beautiful ceremony around every single EJB. See that thing that circled? That's the thing that actually does anything. All the rest of it is noise and ceremony. Not very pleasant. Was obviously a terrible tax on development. And you know, your choices at that point were like CGI or probably cold fusion. I mean, there was nothing out there. Um, ASP.NET. Um, there was nothing out there that was really, really very good. So at least in the Java community, people started to try to fix it. And they started to try to fix it via drawing pretty pictures. So remember rational rows. Remember forward engineering. That apparently wasn't enough. So there were higher level efforts. MDA, 
So we'd have the platform independent model. The great thing about these approaches were that they would ensure that you never had to sully your hands with Java. I mean, why would you ever want to touch code? Like, that's, who does that? People who write code, they're very lowly people. They're not architects. They don't get to sit on gold toilets. So, you know, I think we know what happened with this, and this definitely deserves the order of the golden toilet. It did not work. But nevertheless, Java is still surviving and prospering, and that is because of a totally different direction. And that was principally from Spring and Hibernate, not exclusively, there were Pico Container and Juice, there were many other things as well, but these were the two leaders. And if we think, for example, about Spring, which I think, frankly, was the single most important um, technology, the Spring insights were, you know what? Let people write Java. Don't pretend that writing code is horrid. Let them write Java. And enable things to be testable, enable them to be portable, and also provide a way of taking complex enterprise concerns like transaction management and security checks and delivering them, applying them when needed. What in AOP lingo we call cross-cutting concerns. So this was the original days of spring. You probably recognize the newer logo now. But that was essentially the POJO realization was what saved Java from itself. It was way better than EJB and J2EE. However, it wasn't perfect because there was quite a lot of XML in the early days of Spring. So the XML files could get out of hand. It was way better than what was there before, but it certainly wasn't perfect. And you know, I think, in fairness, it, reserve, it deserves the um, order of the golden toilet second class. So the solution to that problem did come, but it didn't come out of the Java community. It came mainly from the Rails community. Actually, another, um, actually a Dane. Um, I don't know what it is. Is it something in the water in Denmark? Your influence on software, it's, it's astonishing for um, such a relatively small country. So, you know, the insight of convention over configuration in Rails, that was a massive deal. That totally changed things, and it eventually flew on to other technologies, including Java. So in Java, it came back in the form of Spring Boot. This is actually, mo it's about probably a third of the code of a complete Spring Boot web application. Very different from the old XML days, and really centered on the Java with absolutely no ceremony. So, OK, what do we learn from that? What we learned is that application development has gotten a whole lot better by focusing on the code in modern programming languages and not worrying too much about you know, pretty pictures and maybe even minimizing some of the externalized configuration. And lest you think that I'm talking only about Java here, it's, the world is so much better for developing applications than it was 15 years ago. Like, for, frankly, if I had to go and write a web app right now, I wouldn't particularly mind whether I use Spring Boot or Node. I could happily use Node with TypeScript or Spring Boot with Kotlin or Java, and I'd be I'd be perfectly happy. They're, like, I mean, I'm going to write that app very, very quickly, and the app will be pretty easy to maintain. So it was essentially code that saved application development, and the UIs and, you know, proved to be a bit of a dead end. If we think about what we've learned in deployment over the same time, deploying applications is very hard. If you wanted to provision a new server, you needed a forklift. There is no API for a forklift. You also really needed to care about the physical nature of your machine. And then, of course, you had to deploy to things like IBM WebSphere. Yawn alluded to um, application servers. They were heavyweight. It was painful. It was not fun. WebSphere, I must say, definitely deserves the award of the golden toilet, um, first class. Over the years, that changed. One of the first things that caused it to change was virtualization. And again, here I'm using the old VMware logo, not the current one. This, this generation of the VMware logo actually showed what VMware did. Um, so suddenly, you could provision a server without a forklift. And that was a really, really big deal. 
Then, of course, we started experimenting with things like platform as a service, where we kind of had an application server in the cloud, but yes, less painful to use. And I mean, Heroku was the key pioneer there. And then, of course, we discovered that um, with Linux containers and then Docker, that we often didn't even need something as heavyweight as a virtual machine. We could just spin up um, a Docker container. And then, of course, we got into container schedulers and Kubernetes. So, you know, over time, things have gotten way better in the deployment space. And one of the reasons it's better is that infrastructure is now programmable. Git is the source of truth. Everything has an API. Your car probably has an API now, probably has several APIs. Your fridge probably has an API, and your deployment infrastructure has an API. That's a whole lot better if you're a developer than like asking the nice person with a forklift to drive in the correct direction. What has happened in delivery over the same period of time has been significantly less impressive. So there was the key inside of CI in the mid-2000s with Jez Humble and others. It was a massive step forward for our industry. It was as much cultural as technical, and unfortunately, I don't think all those learnings um, are fully absorbed yet. Um, but you know, this was a really, really big deal, wonderful insight. Delivery implementations haven't progressed that much, though, because if you look at what we implemented CI, CD with, we largely did, you know, YAML and Bash, YAML or some other DSL and Bash. That was late 2000s. Then the early 2010s, it's like YAML and Bash in the cloud. And 2018, it's YAML and Bash in the cloud. So how, if we wanted to modernize delivery, how would we do that? I would say we would do that by applying the lessons that we've learned from application development and deployment, right? Remember those things that actually got real good? Why don't we learn some lessons from that? Here, actually, um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee's Tim Berners -Lee's keynote um, last night, Sir Tim said something very relevant. He was talking about computers and said, most people don't think of a computer as a programmable thing, but you do, we do. I would say the same thing should apply for delivery. We should truly think of it as a programmable thing, not something that we hack, but something to which we really bring our core skills. So this is um, why today I'm announcing something called Software Defined Delivery. So we're actually um, setting up a website around a manifesto, which we've started to socialize with folk, around approaching software delivery as a core engineering problem. This is not something that's about specific products. This is something that is really about an approach and a spirit, and I think a radically new way of thinking about this domain. So there are some core motivations for software-defined delivery. Firstly, Delivery matters, right? Delivery is core to everything we do. We shouldn't keep pretending that it's something that someone else will do, that the magical elves will do, or something we can just make good enough. It really matters. Secondly, recognize and celebrate and embrace and build on the world in which delivery is programmable. Guess what? We build things in software, we build things in code, and it's pretty damn great. And that's why, you know, compared to normal people, we're all largely overpaid. It is something that shapes our modern world. Building things in code is important. Let's bring it to how we approach our daily job. So essentially, it's an argument for bringing our engineering A game to delivery. I'm going to give you the URL for the uh, manifesto a little later, so you know, don't worry if you can't read any words. But I'm just going to quickly summarize some of the core premises. And so, as I said, I've started socializing this with um, individuals and companies and seem to be getting a very positive response. We'd love um, you to visit, um, sign up, also suggest changes and improvements because we want this to be an open community discussion process. So firstly, software-defined delivery accepts that software delivery is core. It's fundamental and strategic. 
it is just as important as production code because unless you can get your code to production, it doesn't matter how good that code is. It should be strategic. It shouldn't be based around hacking. Really, you know, Bash should go back to the kind of things that it was originally designed for. It also should be able to evolve just as we evolve our apps. As we learn new things we need to do, like additional security checks or approval gateways or automatically fixing errors that we've spotted in our code um, as it flows through to production, we should be able to evolve it really easily. It should be engineered. What does this mean? How do we engineer applications? Well, we've learned quite a bit about architecture. One thing is we've learned a lot about language design since the Nixon era. Um, so you know, using modern languages is an incredibly powerful thing. Like if you look at what's capable in a modern language and you truly embrace that, you can just about build everything and it will be anything and it will be more maintainable. It should be testable. That's you know, how we practice development in general. I hope you're using TDD. I certainly always do myself. Testability is core to delivering good software. And it should reflect the lessons of modern software architecture. So for example, I think we've seen across the software industry that event-driven approaches are becoming more and more important. They deliver quite a lot of benefits. We should bring those benefits and welcome them into software delivery. Should be collaborative. Collaboration amongst people, among different software tools that we can integrate in a common model and involving people in the process. So for example, seeking to automate all the things that are routine and tedious, but find a way of asking a person, ask the right person or people to make important decisions. Should be accelerated. Um, I don't know how many people have read the Google SRE book. It's an excellent book. One of the key insights that Google has was the idea of 50% firefighting essentially for SREs or site reliability engineers, 50% building stuff so fires don't break out in the future. Or if, even if their things are good and they're not too worried about fires, like make it run faster, make it more secure, like just make 50% of the time making it better. We should bear that in mind and we should try to accelerate our work firstly through reusing the work of our teammates and you know, the work of the community, but also through seeking to automate all the things. Like whenever you find yourself doing something repeatedly, ask if you can automate it. If you can automate it, not only will it be faster, it might be less error prone, but also you've empowered other people on your team to do it. Because maybe you know how to do it and they don't know how to do it. Maybe if you automate that for them, they'll automate some other things for you, and everyone will be a lot happier. And the level of capabilities within the team will rise. Software delivery should be observable. We should be able to trace what's happening um, through the process. We should be able to extract metrics. We should be able to debug what's going on. This is one area, actually, frankly, where present delivery solutions probably do a bit better. Um, you know, they do a decent job of visualization. So the manifesto is at sdmanifesto.org. It went live about half an hour ago. And I would love you if you, you know, like these ideas, please go there, read it, read it carefully, um, sign up using any of your um, various IDs that we support. And you know, if you want to uh, make changes to it, you can submit PRs to the repo. So we want to use some of these coding practices that we advocate around this. I think this is the start of an exciting journey. Because as I said, it's not just about trying to fix the present problems. It's about unleashing developer creativity. If we think of delivery as something we can approach through code, something that we can bring all the learnings that we have from like Turing, Hopper, Dijkstra, all of these amazing people who have contributed to where we are today, if we can bring all of that and focus it on this problem, we can do something pretty amazing. We can do better than you speak. And I think this can be a basis for further innovation. So finally, 
I would leave you with a challenge. Look at your own delivery. Take off the rose-tinted glasses and look at your own delivery in the cold light of day. How many pipelines do you have? How many YAML, how much Bash, how many Jenkins files, whatever? Is there a lot of duplication? How many tasks do you do by hand that actually could be automated if you had the right tools and the right model? Can you make changes in your delivery flows easily? Can you test your delivery flows? And what more could you do if you truly applied engineering principles to how you deliver software? So please join the conversation. Go to sddmanifesto.org if you liked um, what I talked about today. Sign it um, and you know, contribute suggestions. You can um, abuse me on Twitter at, at Springrod. Um, and if you want to talk about this um, on Twitter, you can use the hashtag um, deliver in code. I'm really pretty excited about this. I think that there is the opportunity for approaching this problem in a different way. I think we've been sleepwalking into a direction that is not good. And I think we can change things radically for the better. Thank you.